upon a mountain from where he ascended an angel of the Lord declared that it would be he said don't stand the grieving for the one that you see leaving in like man is coming back for you and me and I believe it's coming back like he said, I believe that a trumpet's gonna sound so loud, one day it'll wake the dead. In the twinkling of an eye, he'll split the eastern sky, and I believe he's coming back, like he said. I believe the time is nearing. We will soon see his appearing, and this could be the hour, yes, this could be the day, when the saints of every nation will lose their gravitation in the middle of the air, be caught away, and I believe he's coming back, like he said. I believe that the trumpet's gonna sound so loud, one day it'll wake the dead. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll split the eastern sky, and I believe he's coming back, like he said. And I believe he's coming back, like he said. It's gonna sound so loud One day it'll wake the dead In the twinkling of an eye We'll split the eastern sky And I believe he's coming back Like he said I'd like you to take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading. We're going to read Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. If you're close to someone and they don't have a Bible, you could share yours with them. Luke 14. We're going to read verses 16 through 24 for our scripture reading this morning. Luke 14 and verses 16 through 24. We read the verses responsibly. We begin together on Verse 16, then I read 17, we'll alternate like that. If you don't have a Bible you'd like one, we have some extras back here. If I just put your hand up, the usher will get you one real quick. Get down here's a couple. There we go. Be happy to let you have that. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Okay. So as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's Word. And we'll begin together on verse 16. Ready? Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer, and Lord, I want to thank you already for the wonderful music today. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit here in the auditorium. And Lord, I'm asking you now that 
you would minister to our hearts through your word. Lord, we pray that uh, you'll help us to focus and to give our attention to the truth you have for us this morning. Again, I do thank you for bringing the guests to us today that you did to enjoy the service with us and then to share a meal with us as well. And we ask your blessing now upon the special as it's given, and the word of God as it's preached. In Jesus' name, amen. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and it's grace so free it's a fish shine for me and deep in its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer, and we thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity to open up your word together. And Lord, we're asking you'll speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, each one of us would give our careful attention to the Bible today and for the truth that you have before us this morning. I pray that you would walk up and down these aisles this morning and in and out of every row, and I'm asking you, Lord, to stop at every occupied seat and minister to every individual here this morning. There's no way possible I can do that. But I believe you can do that. And I ask you to do so this morning. Help me as I bring the truth and help each one of the people as they listen today. And may your hand be upon these next few moments that we spend together, considering the truth of this story that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 14. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Two things I want to ask of you as we go to the message. I'm, first of all, uh, it's not going to be a long time. Okay, I'm not a long-winded preacher. Generally, it's under two hours, so you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> and uh, it won't be long. But I want you to do your best to to not leave or cause disruption. Just try to focus. And if you would, make sure your cell phone's on silent. Uh, some of you are not necessarily used to being in a service on a Sunday morning, and someone may. Uh, I'm for sure they're going to call you today. This will be the day, all right? So if it's silent, then that'll be good, okay? I appreciate your help in that matter, and, uh, and I promise you I'll keep my end of the deal, and I uh, won't be long with you this morning, okay? But I, what I have to say, uh, while not lengthy, is very, very important, and so I appreciate your attention this morning. Luke 14, if you have your Bible open there still, is a uh, story Jesus gave about a man who made a great meal. A great supper, something like you're going to enjoy here in just a little bit, all right? And uh, in Jesus' day, the dinner invitations were a little different than the way we give out the invitations, okay? Uh, the invitations were usually given out well in advance. 
but you never knew just the exact time or date. Uh, it's kind of like sometimes we get a card that says reserve the date or something like that, and so you, you kind of set that date aside and hold it. Well, they would want you to reserve some time, but not necessarily the exact day. Uh, you would just uh, be in preparation, and you would let the host know, I'm coming. You don't know the day, and you don't know when exactly it's going to be, but you would RSVP to the host saying, I will come, you just let me know when it is, count me in, okay? So when he sends out these servants to let people know, come, for all things are now ready, this was not an invitation, this was a reminder that you have promised to come, I want you to know, the meal's ready, it's today. And they would drop what they were doing and they would come. So uh, that was what we were looking at here in Luke 14. As Jesus said, a man made a great supper and bade many. And his servant went out at supper time to say to them that were bidden or that were invited, the ones that had already RSVP'd, to come for all things are now ready. Now the, the larger picture of what the Lord is teaching us here is there's been a great supper prepared. That great supper is the salvation that God has provided for mankind. Okay, God has prepared that for us. And we have all been invited to the supper. What God did was God prepared salvation by sending His only begotten Son. You know, Christmas is not that far away. In fact, we were somewhere last night I think it was a restaurant, and on the door of the restaurant it said 47 shopping days till Christmas. Okay? Isn't that exciting? And, and, and so I know it's coming. But you know what? When the angels announced the birth of Jesus, they said, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, if you're here this morning and say, I ah, don't talk about that saved business, preacher. I don't need to be saved. Well, then we have a problem, don't we? Because God sent a Savior. And if God sent a Savior, that means somebody needed to be saved. And that somebody would be you and me. Okay? If we didn't need a Savior, He wouldn't have sent one. Alright? God knew what we needed, and He sent a Savior. What happened was He, he sent Jesus Christ into this world to... Uh, be a man to in order to die on the cross for our sins. Now the Bible says, Jesus being the Son of God, that He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. That's important because the Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So one, one thing all of us have in common in the room this morning, including the guy you're looking at, and that is we're all sinners in the sight of God. There's nobody here that's going to stand up and say, you know what, preacher, I'd just like to say something today. I went all week and never did anything wrong. I went all week and never committed one sin. Okay? There's no one here that can say that. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God says, consequently, because of that sin, He says, the wages of sin is death. The wages, what we earn or what we deserve for what we've done, God says, if we went to him and said, give me my paycheck, give me my wages for sinning against you, God says, you, what you deserve is death. That's exactly why we die. But the word death is the word separation. That's why it hurts when we lose a loved one. Why is that painful? Because we're separated from them. We can't see them anymore. We can't talk to them anymore. We can't spend time with them anymore. Death is a separation. And so God says, if you got what we deserve for your sin, you would be separated from me forever in a place called hell. Now, hell is just as real as heaven is real. There's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. And God didn't create man to be separated from him in hell. But God is just. And justice says if a crime's been committed, someone's got to pay for it. So God's in a dilemma here. He loves us. He doesn't want us to die and go to hell. But He can't just overlook our wrong. He can't overlook sin and just let us go to heaven anyway. So God, what God did was He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into the world, who lived a perfect, sinless, sinless life and then died on the cross as a payment for our sin. 
Listen very carefully. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 8 that God commended or He demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ died for us. Jesus, not having any sins to pay for, the Bible says He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So He would have no sin, so He would not have to pay the wages of sin, which is death. But we know He went to the cross and He hung there and He bled and He died. So He was paying the wages of sin, which is death. But it wasn't His sins. He didn't have any. Whose sins was Jesus paying for? Exactly right. He was paying for our sins. But wait a minute. Not just for the sins of the world, though He was paying for the sins of the world. But salvation is not just believing Jesus died for the sins of the world. Salvation is when you believe Jesus died for your sin. When I believe Jesus died for my sin. What happened that day on the cross was Jesus Christ, He took every sin that Stan Slayball has ever committed, and even sins that I haven't committed yet, but He knows I will. And He laid those sins on Himself, and He said, God, punish me instead of Stan Slayball. And the agony and the pain and the torment that I would have went through in hell, Jesus Christ went through for me when He died on the cross. That's why on the cross, Jesus cried out to God. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God turned His back on His only begotten Son because our sin was upon Him. You read, the, you read the Gospels, you'll never one time see Jesus referring to God as God. He always said, Father, until the cross. And when our sin was on Him, He said, God, why have you forsaken me? Because He was paying for my sin and for your sin. You see, you put, make, that, make that verse in Romans 5, 8 personal to you. I would say, but God commended His love towards Stan. And that while... Stan was yet a sinner. Christ died for Stan. You'd put your name in there. And you would say that God showed His love toward Dave. And while Dave was yet a sinner, Christ died for Dave. Or God committed His love toward Donna. And while Donna was yet a sinner, Christ died for Donna. You see, whatever your name is, you say, He died for me. He died for my sin. And that's why God said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God says now, I'm talking about life, I'm not talking about death. And when He says when I talk about life, I'm not talking about just life now, I'm talking about eternal life. And that eternal life is not a wage, it's a gift. Is there a difference between a gift and a wage? Sure, if if you don't believe that, I need to see you after service. Absolutely. Wages you have to work for. Gifts are what? Gifts are given to you. But gifts are given to you. Okay? I happen to know something. Now, this isn't a big gift, but it's a bottle of water. Okay? Today is Bob Meyer's birthday. Is that right, Bob? Yeah, good. 21 today. And, um, well, maybe a few years past that. Okay? It's Bob's birthday. Okay? And I have a gift we're going to get to Bob. Okay? For his birthday. Okay? What do you do when, when somebody gets a gift on their birthday? What do you do? You sing happy birthday to him, don't you? All right? Let's sing happy birthday to Bob, okay? Sing it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. There you go. And he got a gift, didn't he? What didn't he do? Did he pull out his wallet and say, okay, what I owe you? No. He didn't say, I didn't hear him say, okay, what do I need to do to have this? Now, it's just, in this case, just a bottle of water. But wait a minute. They don't give those away. Somebody had to go buy that. Somebody had to get in their car, drive to the store, find a place to park, go into the store, find the water, load it in a cart, Stand at the checkout line, check out, bring it back here to the church, and put it probably in the fellowship hall and then eventually over to here so he could have it as a free gift. 
somebody did all that work so he could have it as a free gift. When you were growing up and your parents gave you a gift on your birthday, your mom and dad thought, what do you want? What do you need? Then they would get in their car and drive through the traffic, find a place to park, go into the store, find what it is that you need or want, stand in line, take out their money, pay for it, get back in the car, go through the traffic, come back home. They may wrap it up. They may not wrap it up like I didn't. And, and they said it before you on your birthday. And then they said, happy birthday to you. And you received it. Because you know it's yours. But you didn't earn it. You didn't say, okay, I'll clean my room every day. You didn't say, okay, what do I owe you? You just knew somebody loved you enough to give you a gift. And that you don't work for it. They work for it. See, that's the nature of a gift. Somebody paid for it, but it wasn't you. Now, God said that his gift to us is eternal life. Okay? That's his gift. But then why is it when you ask most people, how do I have eternal life? They start telling you what they got to do. How do, you have, how do you know you have eternal life? Well, now you got to go to church. Well, now you got to get baptized. Well, now you got to try to live a good life. Well, you know, you've got to keep the commandments. Well, it sure sounds to me like I'm trying to earn it. Sure sounds to me like that's a wage. It's not a gift. If it's a gift and it's mine to receive, then I have to realize this. Someone's paid for it. Well, who paid for the gift of eternal life? Jesus did. That's why the verse says, the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to me carefully this morning. You only get eternal life through what Jesus Christ has done. Nobody gets eternal life by what they've done. You get eternal life by what Jesus Christ has done for you. See, He did it for us. Christ died for us. And we get it as a gift, but we know somebody paid for it. And Jesus paid for it with his own blood when he died on the cross. So all things, that's why Jesus could say, come, for all things are ready. And when, when we say at the end of the service, when I get the word from back there that they say, come, everything's ready, you know all you have to do? You just have to come get it. You're going to hold your plate out and they're going to slap on the turkey and slap on the mashed potatoes and gravy and slap on that, that nice roll and some butter. And uh, let's just pray now and we'll eat. No, <laughs> let's, uh, I mean, it is. That's all you got to do is just go get it. When it's at your house and it's Thanksgiving, and boy, the, at, at our house, uh, we have traditional Thanksgiving. You say, what does that mean? That means the women are cooking and the men are watching football. That's what that means. But, uh, and they say, hey, come and get it. It's ready. They don't have to call twice, okay? And uh, boy, we're coming and we know it's time to strap on the feed bag, okay? That every, I don't have to do anything. It's ready. That's what salvation is. God's, God's taking care of all of it. You just accept what He's done for you. That's just like this supper. This, this, this feast, this meal that this fellow made, and finally, whether he did, finally got enough, uh, uh, the, the calf got fat enough to slaughter or they got enough animals to, to butcher to, to take care of the meal. But the invitation is simply to come. Come, for all things are now ready. That word come, somebody said that word come means C is for children. Can children come? Sure. Children can come and put their faith in what Jesus has done for them and receive His gift of eternal life. Oh, older people can come. Oh, I'm too old. Nobody's too old. You, you've still got a pulse? You're eligible, okay? You're eligible to be saved. Uh, come. Children can come. Older people can come. And middle-aged people can come, okay? Hey, Bob, you can come still, amen? Bob, Bob has come, all right? Middle-aged people come. E, everybody can come. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what age you are. Doesn't matter what color skin you have. Doesn't matter what your, how much money you have in the bank or even if you have a bank account. You can come. Everybody can come. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
The amazing thing is, though everything is, is set and everything's ready and there's nothing you have to do. Sometimes I talk to people and say, you know, will you come to Christ? Will you receive His gift? Well, I've got to clean my life up. Well, you don't, you don't clean up and come to Jesus. You come to Jesus, He'll clean you up. Well, i got some things i to get straightened out, preacher. Well, come to Jesus, He'll straighten you out. Okay? You just come and you just come as you are. If you, if you listen to the devil, and his, always his excuse is to, to wait, then you'll be waiting and waiting and waiting. Listen to me. I honestly believe hell is full of people that intended to be saved. Just not now. And they met eternity before they planned on it. Look at the obituaries. Open up a newspaper. Very few people look at a newspaper anymore, but those people didn't all plan on being dead. People died. Those young people that tragically were taken in that, uh, what was that place in uh, Thousand Oaks, California, the, the country bar or whatever it was, mostly, mostly young people in their 20s. They didn't, when they went there that night, they had no idea. This will be my last night on earth. They had no idea. But it was. My thought is, were they ready? Were they, were, did they go to heaven? Were they prepared for that? It's a, it's a great supper. And by the way, it's a great salvation. God has, God has provided all this and we just have to receive it like, like Bob reached out and took that bottle of water. That wasn't hard. You'll do hard things in your life, but accepting a gift isn't one of them. Every one of you have done something like You've received gifts. You've accepted it and said thank you. And you knew you got that because somebody loved you. God offers that gift to you of eternal life. Here, it's, a, it's likened to a great supper, a great salvation. He says, here it is. You just have to accept what I've done for you. Quit trying to think you got to do it yourself because you can't. That's why I sent my son. If we could do it ourselves, why would God send his son to suffer and die like that? What sense does that make? It doesn't make any sense at all. The tragedy is in the story here that we have before us in Luke 14, these, in verse 18, it says, these all with one consent begin to make excuse. They all begin to make an excuse of why they couldn't come. It's pretty amazing. Someone said an excuse is a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. A skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Excuse is usually just something we come up with because we really don't want to do it. These people all begin to make excuses why they said they would come and now they're not going to come. The first fellow said this in verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. First fellow said, well, I've, uh, I've, I've got something I want to see. Or I've, I, you could say in our, in our day, I, I um, purchased some land. I, I purchased some land. I've got some, I'm sorry, that's the uh, first guy in verse 18. I've skipped over to verse 19. First guy said, I bought a piece of ground and I must needs go see it. Have me excused. So he purchased some land. Can you imagine purchasing land without seeing it? I, if you do that, I think I've got some I can sell you. People get swindled that way, you know. You don't buy land that you don't go look at. You'll end up, you think you've got some nice beachfront property in Florida and, uh, and it's not even close. In fact, you've been scammed it's foolish to buy property or buy a home before you look at it and and the truth is this is supper supper is evening let me ask you a question when you want to buy a home and i realize in these days uh, a lot of home looking is done online i know you just uh, go there and they got a camera and takes you all the way through the house and such but you know, there's something old school enough about me. I want to lay my own eyeballs on it. You know, I want to see it in person. 
and I don't make the appointment. I don't call the realtor up and say, hey, I'd like to look at this house about 8 o'clock tonight. How's that sound? I want to make sure it's good and dark. You don't want to go look at a house in the dark. You want to look at it in the light. You want to see any defects that are there. You want to see any problems that might be there. You want to be able to see it. So do you understand this was simply an excuse? Not a valid reason. You don't buy land without seeing it. And you certainly don't go look at it to view it at nighttime. All right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that same piece of ground would still be there in the morning. I don't think it would go anywhere. And he could have looked at it in the morning. The second guy is the one who bought the oxen that I said earlier in verse 19. I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. Have me excused. This was some pressing labor that he had to get done. Something else to do. I got five yoke of oxen. Now here's the amazing thing is, he says, I don't have something to do with them, but I've got to go prove them. In other words, I've got to go check them out and test them to make sure they're good. Well, some guy could have sold him five lame oxen. He doesn't know. But he's already purchased them. He said, I've, I, have, I have bought five yoke of oxen. It's like, hey, you're going to buy a car without ever looking at it? You're going to buy a car without driving it first? Not if you're very smart, you won't. Okay? You got to check it out and, and make sure that, that it's what you want and make sure that the car is worthy and it drives right. So again, don't you see how this was an excuse? Just another excuse. It's a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Now the third guy, verse 20, said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. That's all he said. He didn't offer any other excuse. <laughs> and Maybe he's the only one who had a legitimate one. I don't know. But... Uh, he, uh, he didn't want to come because of a precious lady. I married a wife and I can't come. Now, now wait a minute. He's kind of blaming it on his wife, isn't he? Hmm? But let me ask you this. What, what wife, especially a newlywed, doesn't like to be taken out? Doesn't like to go out? And, and, and every time they say, when you say hello, they say, well, hello. And let the sparkle show. Because I'm married. Okay? And they want everybody to know that. No one, every woman likes to get dressed up and go out for a nice night out. Okay? Uh, don't be like the guy who I heard about. And he and his wife, they were in their house when a tornado hit. And it took the roof off. In fact, they were in bed. It was nighttime. It lifted the entire bed out of the bedroom. It spun it around and set it down two miles from the house. And they were still in bed, unhurt. They were safe. The husband, pretty excited about it all and about the trip they just had, but the wife started crying. He said, honey, what, what's wrong with you? He said, how come you're crying? Don't, don't be afraid. The tornado's over. We're, we're okay. She goes, I'm not crying about that. And I'm not crying because I'm afraid. He said, I'm crying because I'm so happy. Do you realize this is the first time we've been out of the house together in five years? <laughs> huh? Just excuses. What, is, what, is, what does all that mean? What is all that Jesus trying to tell us? I think he's trying to tell us there is no valid excuse not to accept God's offer of salvation by placing your faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. There's no valid excuse. Oh, I still have to do this. Oh, I still have to look at this. Oh, I still have to... And by the way, none of those excuses are sinful in itself. None of them are wrong in themselves. Is it, is it wrong to buy land? Certainly not. Is it wrong to purchase oxen? Well, I don't know about oxen today, but you could... It's wrong to purchase transportation or something you might need for work? Certainly not. Anything wrong with getting married? Absolutely not. I highly recommend it. Okay? But nothing wrong with those things. But, but if they hinder you from coming to Christ, then you've got them in the wrong place. None of those things are worth dying and going to hell over. Don't, don't make that mistake. Don't, don't come up with excuses for not accepting the Lord's invitation. To enjoy his dinner. Okay? Don't, don't make the excuses. Notice what he said at the end. He, by the way, he went out and got others to fill the, 
to fill the banquet. He's got all this food. Somebody's got to eat it. So he went out and got the, the, the poor and the maimed and the, the, the halt and the blind. And he went out in the highways and hedges. He compelled them to come in. But look at verse 24. None of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. I'm going to tell you some very sobering news today. If you reject God's salvation, then He has no other choice but to reject you. None of them were bidden will taste of my salvation. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. Say, boy, that's awful narrow. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what, what the Bible says. That's, those are Jesus' words Himself. And it is a narrow way. Everything has been done for you. Just as everything's been prepared for you today. All you had to do was come. And then enjoy the meal. All you have to do for salvation is come. Come. How do you come? You come just as you are. See? Well, do you have to come and, and live a good life? Come and join the church? Come and do that? No, just come. Just come. Come and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Baptism is something you do after you're saved. After you receive Christ. Baptism is like the wedding ring on your finger. It's an outward symbol of an inward commitment. You receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's something that nobody can see but you. Okay? But when you, when you say I do to your wife and you, she said I do to you, the minister said you have a token of your love for one another. And you said yes, I have a ring. You put that ring on there. When anybody sees you with a ring on your finger, what's that tell you about me? I'm married. I'm committed to somebody. Right? And when people see you get baptized, they're saying they've committed their life to Jesus Christ. They have trusted Jesus as their Savior. It's an outward symbol. It's an outward sign that you believe Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again for your sins. See? Baptism doesn't take you to heaven. Just like if you don't wear a wedding ring, some of you don't have wedding rings, you lost it, or, or for one reason or another you don't have it, it doesn't mean you're not married anymore. See, you're still married because you said, I do. And if you don't get baptized, you're still saved, you're still going to go to heaven. Now, you're going to go dry clean, but you're, you're going to go to heaven. But, but when you put that ring on, it tells everybody, I've received Christ as my Savior, I'm not ashamed of that. And it's just an act of obedience to the Lord. That's all that is. Charlotte Elliott was born in Brighton, England in 1789. Early in her life, she became an invalid through illness. She suffered quite a bit physically through her life and also emotionally and even some spiritually. She had a nephew who wrote this in 1897. Ill health still beset her. It often caused her the peculiar pain of a seeming uselessness in her life. While the circle around her was full of unresting service ableness for God. Such a time of trial marked the year 1834 when she was 45 years old, living in Westfield Lodge, Brighton, England. Her brother... H.V. Eliot had not long before conceived the plan of a St. Mary's Hall at Brighton, which was a school designed to give, at a very nominal cost, a high education to the daughters of clergymen. In the aid of St. Mary's Hall, there was going to be held a bazaar, and all of the town was astir about it. Every member of, a, of the large circle was occupied morning and night in preparations, with the one exception of Sister Charlotte. She was as full of interest as anybody was, but physically fit for nothing. The night before the big bazaar, she was kept wakeful by distressing thoughts of her apparent uselessness. 
These thoughts passed by a transition easy to imagine into a spiritual conflict until she questioned the reality of her whole spiritual life and whether it is just anything more than just a bunch of emotions, an illusion ready to be sorrowfully dissolved. The next day, the day of the big bazaar, she lay on the sofa, and those troubles of the night came right back upon her with such force she felt like they must be met and conquered in the grace of God. She gathered up in her soul her certainties, not her emotions. She started focusing not on her sorrows, but on her salvation. She focused on her Lord and His power and His promise and she took a pen and paper down from the table and she deliberately sat down and began to write in her own, for her own comfort really, and the formula for her faith. And she began to write the verses, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, that that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Then she wrote a second verse, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. And she said, Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. She ended it by saying, Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. How do you come? You come just as you are. Don't have to do anything, you just come. The Lord will take care of the rest. All you do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you call on Jesus and you say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I should pay for my sin in hell. But I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for me. You paid for my sin debt. And Jesus, I now trust you. And trust in the Bible simply means you put your weight on it. You have your weight in that chair you're sitting in this morning. You know why? You trust the chair. And God says when you put all your weight on Jesus Christ and what He has done for you and say, I'm trusting what He's done for me. Not, not a good life, not a church, not anything I do. I'm trusting what He's done for me. And you put your faith in Him. Then God says you'll receive His gift of eternal life and you shall be saved. Did he say you might be saved? No. Didn't say you could be saved or you might be saved. He said you shall be saved. Listen to me. That's a guarantee. Not from me, but from God. That if you receive his son as your savior, he gives you the gift of eternal life and promises a home in heaven one day. What do you got to do? Come. That's all it is. Just come. Let's bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's kind attention today. Thank you for a great salvation that you have provided for us through Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, for being, Him being buried and rising again the third day. Lord, we're not asking people to trust a dead Savior. We're asking them to trust a living Savior. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you made it to where it's as simple as receiving a gift. And I'm asking you this morning, Lord, that there'd be 
those in this room that have never accepted his invitation to come and receive his gift of eternal life, that they would accept his gift this morning. Now our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. Just, just, just between you and God right now. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor, based upon what you just said this morning, if Jesus Christ is willing to be my Savior and willing to give me the gift of eternal life, then I am willing to put my faith and trust in Him as my Savior today. And the Bible says we call on the name of the Lord and calling always means prayer. If that's in your heart this morning, I'd like to help you word a prayer to God. Now, now listen carefully. If all you do is say words after me, that's all they are is words. God is not just listening to your words this morning. He's looking at your heart. And if you from your heart would trust Jesus as your Savior and receive his gift of eternal life, then why don't you pray something like this right now, just to you and God. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I should pay for my sin in hell. But I believe you died on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I now trust you and what you have done for me to give me the gift of eternal life and one day take me to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Please help me live for you.